Mr. Gabelli is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Gamco Investors. He is an Executive Chairman and Associated Capital Group. He is summa cum laude, graduate from Fordham University, not too shabby, sir. And he holds an MBA degree from Columbia University Graduate School of Business and is an honorary doctorate degree from Rob Roger Williams University and also from Fordham. He is a member of the Board of Overseers of Columbia University Graduate School of Business and the Board of Trustees of the Boston College and the Board of Trustees of Roger Williams University. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Italian Cancer Foundation and the Foundation for Italian Art and Culture. That sounds like a very fun... I like that one very much. He is trustee of the Winston Churchill Foundation of the United States. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this one, the E.L. Wygand Foundation? Okay. Mr. Gabelli was Morningstar's Portfolio Manager of the Year in 1997 and Institutional Investor's Money Manager of the Year in 2011. He is a member of Barron's Financial Magazine's All-Star Century Team. We want to welcome him, and he has shared with me that he's going to welcome your questions while he presents. And uh, we would like you to give him our official warm South Florida greeting to the South Florida CFA Society. Please welcome Mr. Gabelli. You know, I feel like the coach of the, the Philadelphia Eagles when he threw, uh, a, had a pass thrown to his QB. I, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I've got to try to figure out how I'm going to do it different and interesting for you. How is that? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, you I, they were worried about something else. So we have a mixed group. Some of us want to know about fixed income. Some of us want to know about equity. Some of you want to know about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Some of you will not be happy because I will say nothing about one of those subjects. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... Uh, 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 well, <laughs> While you're eating, let's do the following. Today, the German uh, Bund has rallied to 70 basis points, the 10-year. And the Japanese 10-year is 7 basis points, and the U.S. 10-year is 285. When the 10-year moved up, so where do you put your client money? Do you buy munis? What does the tax dynamics impact have on issuers like in the state of New York or Connecticut that are going bust and that will be exacerbated by the SALT program? Do they buy them because you have Rick Scott in Florida who's one of the best? Or, the, uh, and, uh, or do you, uh, what do you do in terms of uh, the ladder that you're buying for clients? Where do you put fixed income? Do you do global? Do you do international? Do you buy U.S.? We don't care. We're an equity shop. <laughs> so then the question is, do you buy global? Do you buy equities in the U.S.? Do you buy ETFs? So, I'm gonna kind of bore you, but you're stuck, so thank you. And this is us, and this is, uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, and thank you, Chris, for having us. Incidentally, I've been, I have one of my classmates that go, belongs to a club down in Clintmore, and I pass by here all the time at the Boca Club, but I've never turned right. I kept going and made it right at the block. So this is a number that I want you to remember. I think there's somebody else that has a number 2370. I can't see where he is, though. Uh, he's here somewhere. And uh, CFA, number? CFA number. This one here, look, this is me. OK. Now, this here is something that you should think about. It's not Larry Fink 10 years from now. <laughs> it's not the president of Vanguard. This is what people are saying is an active manager. <laughs> so I said I, I don't agree with that, but that's a different issue. So let's look back. I pick a date of 1955 for a reason I'm not going to tell you. But in 1955, how many CFA members were there? 2,100. Now, how many of those are active? How many are quants? How many are Momo guys? And we'll talk about that. So today, uh, we have to talk about the politics of the day, which was that they passed the bill and the Senate Schumer got together with his uh, other counterpart. And then we're going to talk about this guy. No, uh, no subject. We're not talking about politics. This is also out. 
And uh -oh, artificial intelligence, we don't need it. Everybody here has human intelligence, so that's better. But we're going to talk about stocks, OK? That's what I do. I started as an analyst, as you heard. I graduated on a Friday. On a Friday. I went to work on a Monday. Now I hire individuals to do my, join us in research. They take three months off to travel around the world. The day I joined Low Broads as a sell-side analyst uh, it was a Monday morning. On Friday night, Michael Steinhardt quit, and he started at one of the most successful hedge funds, and he retired in 1994, but Mike's still active, and he covered the autos. And there's a fellow in this room that was the IR at Eaton, and he tells me, Mr. Hamilton tells me, that he remembered some of the questions I used to ask when I used to go to One Air Review Plaza in Cleveland to talk about Eaton. And uh, I covered the autos, so I covered farm equipment, I covered conglomerates. And one of the conglomerates was Gulf and Western, and they owned Paramount. So when I had a chance to pick up the entertainment industry, Phil, uh, and thank you for having me, by the way, I figured uh, that I would cover uh, companies in Los Angeles. So the question that you have to ask in the equity world, active versus passive, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I will, uh, it's like giving, if I was a minister, I would talk about virtue, and then I would turn it over and say, I'm going to give the floor to the devil. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't. By the way, I assume we're not recording this. <laughs> Phil tells me I'm recorded. Now, nah, come on. Alexa, what happens if the US market goes down? Larry, are you trying to make money in a down market with an ETF? Or maybe a low volume. You can't. One. Unless you're short. Come on, you gotta have fun in this business or we're really... Alexa, why should we become CFAs? Larry, you should. A CFA is for all seasons and all times. There you go. Now, we all know about Sully. Look at all the titles he has beyond being a pilot. <laughs> Does any of them fit? Thank you. Alexa, what happens if the US market goes down? You have your experience, Sully. You'll take care of it. <laughs> and uh, look, the answer is we all have, some of us have clients. Some of us have our own mindset. When the market keeps going up in October, uh, November, December, and Bitcoin goes from 600 to, to uh, eight, 15 or 18,000, clients are calling up and saying, how come you didn't get me more invested? And these same ones in February of 09, which was when the bargains were, or when I started the firm in January of 1977, uh, that's when the bargains were. They would panic and say, I don't want to own stocks. In fact, what we do in the equity market, as we, uh, and we'll hear more about that later, because I left William Lobroads and went to William D. Witter, we merged into Drexel, I walk into Tubby Burnham, I said, Tubby, I'm starting a firm, and thank you for the 90 days I was here. And basically, we covered industries that we have accumulated and compounded knowledge. So we cover now the auto parts industry 41 years later, and we're gonna talk about driverless cars, we're gonna talk about cars that are no owners, no owners, and then there will be cars with no, no need of roads. So we talk, the world changes all the time. And when I started, we maybe sold three or four million. Today we're selling 96 million cars on a global basis and there's 1.3 billion on the road. And so what is Musk gonna do? So I'm gonna talk about who we are, investments, financial engineering, and uh, some case studies. But let's go through some of them, housing. Not too far from here is Lenar, Stuart Miller. Okay, the housing market was about 1.3 million and the millennials, were, everyone is saying they're not gonna own homes, they're gonna be all cliff dwellers, but we think there's a long runway for housing. And that we're seeing of, and single family starts are in the 850,000, multifamilies or something else, that's a different issue, and we think you'll still average 1.3, 1.4, so the Lenars of the world, and in the case of Lenar, there's a Lenar B, that's the voting stock, that sells at a 12 point discount from, and when I follow the philosophy, have your money where the owners are. 
So that's an interesting area that we like, and the whole ecosystem. Infrastructure, inland waterway, airports, avionics, anything you can think about. We are like this area. Uh, you know, the president uh, understands how to, uh, a great line. We built the Empire State Building in two years, and now we can't even clear a field in two years. Uh, we think a lot to be done there. The, we host a meeting for the last 25 years on pump valve and motor companies, and we have one coming up in three weeks. We have the Society of Engineers that come and give a presentation. They have, every four years, they give a report on our infrastructure. They have rated, they have rated the 525,000 bridges. They've given an upgrade from a D minus to a D plus. They, we have need for D minus to D plus. Not so bad, it's improving. Um, inland waterway, the agricultural part of the United States is very fundamental to our competitive dynamics on a global basis. And uh, I said there were 142,000 CFAs. In 1955, we had two and a half million people, two and a half billion, we have seven and a half billion today. And that infrastructure is needed for food and transportation and we have a comparative advantage. Health and wellness, I'll talk about that later, but one thing, uh, we found a company here in Boca called National Beverage that sells LaCroix. What do we need is to eliminate sugar. Oh darling, sweet it is. And then pet parents. Some of you read in one of the local newspapers about what's going on with pet parents uh, in the Olympics. But I don't wanna get into that. I was told not to until after dinner. Live events, Gen Z and millennials. How do we do live events? I want you all to tell me that you love baseball and you will buy for your clients a baseball team. I want you to buy the Atlanta Braves. The stock is $22, run by John Malone. He controls it, and he's gonna sell it and flip it. And you're buying it for a billion and a half dollars. They move from downtown Atlanta to Cobb County. Basketball, I was gonna recommend the Knicks. They lost Pazingas the other night. Uh, betting, Steve Wynn, out, MGM in. Uh, soccer, Man U, uh, Beyonce and Bieber. And, these, and the military, today we finally are putting some money to work. I'm not recommending any Chinese military companies tonight, so I don't want to disappoint you. But I'm going to recommend certain companies. And these are some of them. Lenar, in the infrastructure, their equipment rentals. These are the Ubers of the, of the equipment rental business. Half of what construction organizations do is rent equipment, aerial platforms and so on. There's a company right here uh, on the other side on the West Coast uh, in uh, Bonita Springs called Herc Reynolds, spun off from Hertz, United Reynolds in Stanford, Ashtead in London. These are the kind of companies you want. Xylem and Water, Natural Beverages right here, run by an 80-year-old guy that owns the company and he's ready to give you money to manage. No, nobody cares, I got it. The Atlanta Braves, these are some of the examples of companies that we like. And uh, you know, thanks to uh, the market, in the last 40 years, we went public through Merrill Lynch in 1999. Our chairman was, did a pretty dumb thing at the time and took it public. It was Merrill Lynch and uh, Smith Barney. And by the way, I was the chairman. So we're public. So case studies, if I have time, I'll go through Madison Square Garden. I'll go through equipment rentals, sparkling water, which is national beverage, and pet parents. Pet parents are 94 million cats in the United States. 88 million dogs, 8 million horses, all in Wellington. <laughs> so we have investing versus trading. We, uh, you know my philosophy. What we do is we take an industry, and we have accumulated and compounded knowledge, and we take that, we look for companies that have cash flow, we look at them as a private equity. So in 1977, when I started the firm, you could buy stocks at three or four times EBITDA. Today, they're telling me they're cheap at 20 times. Eh. In 1979, I had to convince individuals to own stocks because the headlines on Business Week was the death of equities. So what we did was we said, look, you used to be back, there used to be in the 60s, they call it bootstrap financing, then it became leveraged buyouts, and now it's PE. We took a company and said, if we can buy it at an eight multiple, or six multiple of EBITDA, and we kept the multiple five years constant, and we could do leverage 
of X on the uh, borrowing, uh, bank debt, intermediate debt, and equity, and what percentage do we have to put up for equity? What will we earn if we hold it for five years? So we said if we took a company that was public and made it private, private market value, and because we were trying to make a living, uh, we had to convince people to buy businesses or invest in them, we said that we have to have a catalyst, something that was visible that would surface the value. So we came up with the PMV with a catalyst approach a long time ago. It still works, but it's very hard to do it when justifying an 18 multiple and figuring out what your exit strategy is. So the PE guys, now this guy is a guy that was a trader. I think he sold one company called Berkshire Hathaway. Now, Warren has, is uh, the classic value chap. Uh, we started following him when he owned a company in the, in the, called Pinkerton's, but he also, we, uh, we knew each other from the local business school in New York. I started the firm in 1977. You put $64,550 into Berkshire. No dividends, no taxes that you had to pay. And during that period, very little turnover. Today it would be worth $215 million. That was December 31st, so a 22% Kager. This is investing. And uh, Buffett has finally decided to appoint Ajit Chain and, uh, and Abel as his vice chairman, so he now has management succession. The problem is, that the new tax rule has what they call a NEO, named executive officer, and you can't pay them over a million dollars or they can't have a tax deduction. So I'm gonna start working for nothing for our firm. I'll fix those guys. Eh. Uh, you'll have to have a benefit for me, stop. So this is us, uh, somebody put a commercial in here. If you, we compounded, and this is GIPS compliant, 15.3% net, so if you gave us a million, it would be 312 million. I didn't have a million, I'd lucky to have 25,000 then. And uh, this is what Buffett, so no matter how good we are, okay, 312, that million dollars with a Buffett. And there were many times during that period, like in 1999, when uh, you could buy .com in Boston, they had a fishgo.com or some pet.com at $20 billion. They were booing Buffett out. His stock was selling at $40,000. He's put an ad out saying, I'll buy the stock. Just sell it to me. And uh, now it's worth 500, 400 billion. He's got 1.6 million shares of 300,000. It's too big for me. Sorry. You guys can deal with Apple and uh, all those guys. So this is it. OK, so this is me. That's 3271. That's me. And I took the exam in part because I figured the CFA would become a union and that at the age of 80, I would have to take a test to practice. So I did it early. Do it, okay? We have an individual that's taken series one working on what, two, three? Good for you. And this is what I looked like 35 or 40 years ago be <laughs> before, J oh no, 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 this is my cousin. Jimmy. Tonight's special guest, Mario J. Gabelli. I just wanted you to know I had red hair and I was seven foot tall. Mario, welcome, we're delighted to have you here. Oh, it's a privilege to be here, Lou. Please sit down, thank you. Mario Gabelli is living proof. Since his first appearance as my guest eight years ago, Mario Gabelli has been recognized as one of the nation's foremost investors with an outstanding gift for uncovering undervalued companies that later get noticed by other people. Indeed, most of the stocks he mentioned in his first appearances on the program have since been taken over. That's what we like. And one of the philosophies we have is pretty simple. Where do we want to own businesses that make sense over the next three or four years? Not what made sense over the last three or four. In 1972-3, the banks coming off the economic pullback were buying the Nifty 50, Avon, Polaroid, Xerox, Kodak, and I can name a few that did okay, like McDonald's. In the 1999, we had the, the dot-coms, the TMTs, so where is the puck going? Are the challenges that we had on Monday because of the, uh, the vol uh, and the inverse indexes, should, what will happen? Is there not enough liquidity in the system? Uh, are we gonna have a meltdown to follow a melt up? What happened in the last three days? Is that gonna continue? You know, those are the questions you're gonna ask somebody else. <laughs> now this guy here was also a product of the 60s. And he's still doing it, and that's, you know, I, that's what I like. I like reading annual reports, though I must admit that somebody gave me a book called Principles to Read. My neighbor, Ray Dalio, decided to embed himself. I, I'm still having trouble understanding what he's talking about. 
Now this is what this guy looked like then, this is what he looks like now. And I'm sorry about that. We had Brady up here, we had to take him down. <laughs> He's only gonna be 41. The good news about our business is you don't need hand-eye coordination. I just have a couple of people from Boston that are dying right now with this picture. Sorry about that. So this is a cousin of mine. Everything that has been invented has been invented. The best thing about capitalism is the ability to take and destroy what is. Jeff Bezos is doing what Henry Ford did to manufacturing. He's doing what is do doing it to distribution. How and what can he do to help reduce the cost structure of what people buy and sell? And this guy probably would have said, eh, we can. Another guy that I like, he looks like some of the people I know. It's not the strongest of the species that survive. It's not the most intelligent, but it's the ones that have changed. Any event, we like creative innovation. We think it works, it's good for the society. Unfortunately, this is our firm. We went public, as I said, uh, and uh, we run about 40 billion. Uh, of just equities. Um, we started in 1977, research-driven, absolute return, private market value with a catalyst with tax sensitivity. We, have, we opened it offices in uh, Tokyo right after Fukushima. We have one in Shanghai. Uh, we had one in Hong Kong until the guy, I figured out he wasn't working. I said, how come? He says, well, my wife's making so much money, I'm retired. And he was 38. Uh, so we're looking to open an office again in Hong Kong. We have one in London and uh, several in the States where we do research. What is value investing? Since we all know it, I'm not gonna spend any time on it, but basically this is what was started in 1934. Uh, it was Graham and Dodd. I was an accounting major, philosophy minor, and then I took a, uh, a course in Columbia. I knew I wanted to be in the investment business, and I took a course with Roger Murray, and the sun, the moon, and stars came together, and I said, I wanna do research. So that's what I do, I do research on stocks. Sorry about that, if you thought I was something else, it is what it is. And uh, these are a couple of guys. This is Buffet talking about it, beginning of 50, my performance, and, it, and he was a student of Ben Graham. So I know you're quick and you know this, so I'm not gonna spend any time. This is the guy that taught me, uh, and Roger Murray. Now let me close this morning with. Before I talk about it, he had been booed out of the classroom in 1972 in Nifty 50. I got him to come back to lecture and he was a young guy at the time at the Museum of Television Radio, now is uh, the Paley Center, and he gave four lectures over four different uh, weeks, uh, an hour and a half each, and anybody wants these tapes, you can have them, we have them available to you. Uh, and uh, because of this, the local business school there brought back value investing. They had eliminated it, and the dean attended Now let me close this morning with uh, a, uh, a, a, a question uh, that I'm going to put to you. In some parts of this world, some not um, uh, unknown uh, to all of you, there is an expression called private market value. A fascinating uh, uh, expression. I ask myself is, uh, we really ought to get uh, uh, Mario to answer this, are we talking about intrinsic value dressed up, given a different label, because it's more appealing uh, to, to people if I talk about private? Anyway, that was Roger, uh, and this is the guy that's doing it now. I, uh, this is, monument is still up, even though some people would probably take it down. Jefferson, Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, and uh, I got the names wrong, but that's okay. Uh, basically, Washington said, and we basically said the four value investing gurus are Graham, Dodd, Murray, and Greenwald, and so we have uh, that, uh, we give a prize out every year of a million dollars is put in the kitty, and uh, we, uh, this is our 15 year, Columbia picks the individual, this time it's a fellow by the name of Chris Stavro, we had a, a chap that just got a, a Nobel Prize, he's an academic, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, was it Taylor, Thayer? And uh, he was, uh, so Roger, the Columbia picks the individuals and we give the prize. Our research is simple, gap it. Gather, array, project, interpret, and communicate. Gather the data by looking at public information, cues, trade magazines, go to visit companies, array it the way we want, and that is figure out what is the company worth, 
What's the, what's the private market value going to be in five years? Where's your margin of safety? How, what happens to Mr. Market when you have days like Monday and Tuesday morning at about 5.30 was uh, interesting. And uh, it's called Gather, Array, Project, and Interpret, and Communicate. And that's what we do every day. And that's the fun part of the business. It's what we get excited about. It's finding a world of constant change. Dr. Pepper, you wake up, my favorite drink, DDP. They go private with Keurig, a reverse merger. Jakob uh, Ben Kiesa decides to do it. Who else is going to do it? What other deals are going to take place? How do they uh, surface values? And our research is basically, uh, it's changed a lot, and I can get into it. And uh, research as the sell side is dying, and we'll talk about that if you have an interest. And where does the analyst go? This is a guy in, uh, looking in uh, Monte Carlo at ideas. The papers are gone, looking for ideas in South Georgia. This one here is not in Yeehaw Junction. This is South Georgia. Uh, oh, come on. You know where Yeehaw Junction is. Uh, the investment process is fairly simple. What's the economy going to do? Look, I'll give you five numbers. The global economy is $84 trillion. The United States is 25, uh, 20 odd percent of that. Europe is about 20 odd percent of that. Germany, for example, the real GDP has grown nicely yesterday. They just reported a big kick up. Europe's improving. China and Japan are 20 odd percent. So when you think about that, and you throw in India, if you really are interested, and what's the world going to do? And how much is it going to increase? The second part that we think about is the deficit in the United States, about $500 billion. We owe 20 trillion. How do we solve that problem? We have Janet Yellen just retired. Jay Powell is running it. Draghi in Europe and Kuroda in Japan. How are we going to sustain this economic growth if we pull back the $10 trillion that's in the marketplace? The third number is the balance of payments. Why is Trump with uh, Lighthouser and with all of his teammates like Wilbur Ross, what is he doing with all his BS between NAFTA and the Chinese and the TPP and what's going on? And these are the simple things to talk about. We'll do that in a minute. Oh, look at this sign. Taxes are going up. What does this say? Why? Because the tax rate for individuals, your clients have gone from 39.5 to 37. And if you're in Florida, there's no salt tax. If you're in places like New York where you're paying 10%, they reduced your tax rate by 2.5 in the federal, but you got 10%. So what's going to happen? They're coming down to Boca. You are damned in this part of the world. And Vero Beach is next. So this is the economy, and this is the guy, and this is his answer to his prayer, and this is a question mark. How is Jay going to do? First day on a job, and the market greets him and plunges 1,000 or 2,000 points. Any event, I look at the world fairly simple. I'll do this very quickly, but too bad, because you're only on your entree. Currency. If I'm running a company and 40% of my earnings are outside the United States and I'm in the S&P 500, and let's assume for hypothetical purposes, it's all Europe. The euro started, first trade was on 1-1 one, one, at a buck 18, it got all the way up to, right now it's 124. So not only is the European economy improving, even with the problems with Russia, uh, but I'm gonna translate into higher revenues. So the transcripts and the earnings calls that you're getting now, you're seeing the impact of that. And the pound, the pound despite Brexit, is back to 140, 138 this, this afternoon. So you're getting the translation gain, that's important. Now I'm gonna focus on the balance of payments, I'm gonna do it very quickly. We, why are we worried about the balance of payments? Because we owe the world $500 billion and the Chinese are taking that, they already own Florida, Texas. So we got $19.5 billion GDP, call it 20 among friends. We do okay at exports. We do a better job at imports. So our balance of payments on the trade deficit 12 months through LTM through 930 is 545 billion. That means every year we're giving money to non-holders. But when I said to you that the GDP is $20 trillion, it's a combination of the consumer, it's a combination of industrials, combination of state and local government, plus or minus exports. This subtracts from the US GDP. So there's a lot of elements that go into that mix. But the bottom line is that we have a deficit and we want fair trade. I talked to guys in the steel industry, I talked to aluminum, 
you know, you transcript from China to Vietnam to Brazil and to Mexico, you gotta, you gotta re-examine that. And do I care about it? No, because it's declining as a percentage of GDP, but it's still a big number. And the biggest problem is this one. Oop, I didn't circle it, I'm sorry. It's a trade deficit with China. How do we solve that? And how do we get them to help out with Point Yang after the Olympics are over? In any event, this is uh, the number I said about the world GDP, 84 trillion, this is an IMF number. And uh, this is China, and this is important. The US consumer, that's us, has 70% of GDP. The wealth of our, your client base and everyone that we deal with at the end of January, I, didn't, I don't know what it is now, <laughs> it was about $100 trillion. $115 trillion of gross assets, $15 trillion of debt. The Chinese are 40% of their economy, and we think that will grow at 10% a year real. So that's plus four. The balance only has to grow at two or three. So I think the Chinese can do quite well at a 6% real growth plus inflation. And, they are, and this is not purchasing power parity. This is just nominal dollars. Consumer wealth, that's everybody in this room. <clears throat> Third quarter, we don't have the final fourth quarter yet, so I've, uh, assets were 112 trillion, 15 trillion of debt, 96.9. We're well over 100. Uh, when you hear Buffett talking about $100 trillion of wealth, this is it, okay? There's a problem with this number, though, and this is the makeup of it. The problem is, because aside from inequality and wages, this is the real problem. A generation of students in the last 10 or 12 years, student debt, let me give you these numbers and blow them up. In the third quarter of 07, assets were 72 trillion, they're now 100, let's call it 115 or 116 primarily of financial assets. The net worth has gone up from 58 trillion to 100 trillion. So the consumer's in great shape. This is the problem though. Student loans have gone to about 1.4 trillion and car loans, car loans are a problem. We've got to deal with that, a different subject. But the student loans is really a real challenge. There's got to be a solution to that. And then we have uh, Angela just, Angela just uh, solved her problem. They got the government the other day. Teresa is working on Brexit. She'll solve that. How many of you saw the darkest hour? Any event, capital allocation. I'm a, as I said, I'm on, uh, Krista mentioned I'm on the Winston Churchill board. We take American scholars who have uh, 4.5 out of four and bring them to the Churchill School and we've gotten in the last 40 years or 50 years a lot of uh, Nobel Prizes from those individuals. This is what we do. This is not a sex word, so don't worry. Plain old stock picking. We take one company at a time that we like, figure out how to put it into the portfolios, and then I get beat up by guys like Gino and Scott telling me what to do. And this is what we do is, what is the private market value? If I could tell Nick Carparella, who's 80 years old, what to do, I doubt I could. And he owns 80% of the companies, so I'll never be able to do it. What would he be able to get in this sparkling water company? Will he sell it? How much would he get? Why would he want to? Uh, so we looked at that with a catalyst. And I'll, well, the catalyst could be anything, a regulatory change. Right now, for example, the Federal Communications Commission is going through a major change Will they allow Tribune to be bought by Sinclair? Will they allow Time Warner to be bought by uh, te Telephone? Will they allow Fox to be bought by Disney? So the whole change, will we allow net neutrality to take place? Those are the things that create catalysts. Uh, the, the other one that's really obvious is taxes. The death of a fountain, no, that's something else. Uh, repurchase, share, sell of the division. And then what we have is these guys. Activism, does it make sense for, Peter, for uh, Nelson Peltz to go after Procter & Gamble? Did it make sense uh, for, uh, oh come on, I'm drawing a blank. Ackman to go over, uh, to go try to attack ADP. And activism, uh, you know, your clients own the company, our clients own the company. We are always looking at companies and saying, are they doing the right thing in terms of capital allocation? Financial engineering, obviously we're big fans of mergers. We have some books that we wrote on arbitrage. Uh, in fact, Regina wrote the book. She didn't get any royalties. Give a person a fish and you feed them for a day, you teach them to be arbitrageurs and you fed them forever. We're writing a new, 
We're writing a new book on arbitrage. We have Elliot, we have 18 individuals that you will recognize the names. The book will come out. We had Kate Welling help me write it. She was an editor at Barron's when I was on the panel for way back when. And uh, we have three companies. And so we have the book. We did it in uh, Japanese, we did it in Chinese, and we did it in Italian. And uh, anybody that wants a copy, they're in the back, just get them. I did not proofread three of those. <laughs> But we had teammates, incidentally, Gino, we have 220 individuals. We have 130 different, we don't have anybody from the Boilermakers, but we have a lot of undergraduates uh, that we have in, this, in the office. So that's us. And this here is uh, the first time she wound up leaving uh, CNBC to go to uh, Fox. What is she saying? If you had to you know, make a bet, and you have to make a bet every day, in terms of where the real opportunity is in um, investing in equities yeah, today. Yeah, um, Maria, we are basically been doing the same thing for 45 years. We started following the Graham and Dodd, Roger Murray, Bruce Greenwald continuation of the philosophy of doing security analysis. One company at a time, one industry at a time, and where do we take the intellectual energy we have as a firm and apply it? So we gather information, array it, project it, and interpret the way we want. And then we look for that catalyst. What's going to make the stock go? Any event, we have 40 analysts, we have 20 portfolio managers, and uh, we work their uh, dynamics. But we do things a little different. This guy here is Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum. I went to Abu Dhabi and Dubai. I mean, he's at Dubai. Why? Because why were these guys involved in the gambling business? So we looked at all the other companies, we engineered it, we had a, uh, one of the analysts grew up in Riyadh, and uh, we basically uh, uh, took a look at Dubai Investment Authority and said, hey, then we figured it out. And then I came back and I said, why don't we do everything for Dr. John Malone? Malone is a financial engineer lo located in Denver. He was in the cable business, he's done a lot of things. But he has his fingerprints on all these companies. If we add it up, it's about $400 billion. Not as much as Buffett, not as much as uh, the guys that run Apple, but it's a uh, living. And, but he basically, he basically builds up the companies and then he sells them. That is what we like. So we took a look at some of the companies and which ones do we want to own. One of the companies that he's involved in uh, through Liberty Media, not Charter, I don't have it. Unfortunately, it's the Atlanta Braves. We know that he's building this up. He also controls uh, Formula One, Live Nation, and those companies are being nurtured to be built up and sold. So the Atlanta Braves has 58 million shares. The symbol is B-A-T-R-A. It's, uh, I'm gonna cuff the number, $22 a share. So multiply that, you got the debt, you get the park, you get the stadium. It's called uh, the SunTrust Stadium. It's uh, really a terrific uh, place. And uh, then you have Jeter that bought the Marlins. You know how successful he's gonna be. Um, and then we did this guy, Carl Icahn, and what does he own? And Icahn Enterprises is public because we, he owns a big piece of Hertz, but he also owns a big piece of Navistro, which we are the largest shareholder with him, and we are the largest shareholder in Herc. And then we uh, did this one on Christina Stenbeck. She's in Stockholm, and uh, no cousin. And basically, the company that we know Malone is going to buy, she, own, uh, she controls. And that's the company that's public in Stockholm. We visit them every so often. She also lives in London. She also went to Georgetown. And uh, the company that we're interested in is Millicom. There's a cable company in Latin America. There's 100 million shares of stock trade to the Teddy. Probably $69, $7 billion market cap, $4 billion of debt. We think Malone will buy it. The guy that runs it came out of one of Malone's companies. And they'll consolidate cable in Latin America. An easy story. You'll make 50% in three years. Liberty Braves is better because it's easier. And it's easier to talk about. Uh, Atlanta than it is about uh, Columbia, South, not Columbia, South Carolina. Then we have a company, this guy has also made us a lot of money, Exor. Now when you talked about the American Italian Cancer Foundation, Alan Elkon is his father, and he's the chairman of that organization. He teaches at Wharton, at the Penn, University of Pennsylvania, but he takes art from Europe that hasn't ever been exposed in the United States. So we got to know these guys, and uh, this is a company uh, Morgan Stanley, I think, took it public. I could be wrong. It was at $52 IPO price. The stock dropped to 36. It's now 125. 
So I know, Phil, you, uh, you, you drove up with your Ferrari, your wife dropped you off. No, but I drove by that factory in Italy. There you go. And you stayed at a Holiday Inn last night, too. I got it. Exactly. So uh, they make 8,800 cars. You know, so we watched this guy do this financial engineering. He joined the company about, so what are we interested in? We're interested in infrastructure. We own John Deere forever. We own Cummins Academy. But this company is symbol to CNH, 1.3 billion shares. The stock is 14 on the New York. And this is the company, and this is a truck company in Europe that has a 5.6% share of the European Class 8 market. Those are the big trucks. And they're going to merge that, if I'm right, with Packard. Packard is a 15% share with a company called DAF. And Case New Holland will be left with the farm equipment business in the United States that competes with Deere. And as you saw with Atco and Deere, Deere is $165. With the new tax bill, I can buy a piece of equipment and get 100% write-off. So Phil is buying an aircraft. He's buying a G450. But I have to buy a, you know, a, a small 35 horsepower John Deere, the best I can do. Uh, I'm not going to buy a Case New Holland. I will not buy a, a Mahindra. Any event, this stock, I think, will earn a buck 20 in three years. I think the stock will trade in the low 20s. And I think you'll have some financial engineering. And they just announced a deal with Microsoft to do some automated uh, truck driving. Very good, Belly. Let's get some, uh, some thoughts. Joining us now, a Gamco investor, chief investment officer, who always has a really uh, interesting thesis. Thesis, 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 thesis. Something like that. About a lot of different stocks. I want to start with, uh, we, we don't revisit a lot of the stuff that you talk about sometimes. And do you remember the last time you were on? Uh, okay. Do you remember some of your main themes? No, then? give me them. I don't know. You always <laughs> you look them up. <laughs> You've always no, I haven't. You've always liked Fortune Brands and what's no. Name? Yeah, we like financial engineering spin-offs. Spin-offs. I'm not going to spend any time on it. This is Cablevision, a New York company. The Dolans own it. He's got a place in Wellington. Uh, this is his son Jimmy, and they spot, they sold Cablevision to Altice. They uh, took Madison Square Garden, they spun it off to the shareholders before that, and they spun off a company called AMC Networks, the symbol is AMCX. Josh Sapan runs this. This is the Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, those kind of, you know, better call Saul um, type. But I like Madison Square Garden because they also spun off MSG. Once you have a company that does financial engineering, they understand how easy it is and the directors are pretty comfortable and Nelson Peltz is on the board, it's among others. They're going to do more. Will they spin off their entertainment business? Will they uh, focus on live entertainment? Will they do esports and e-gaming? All of which will enhance the company. So we basically take Madison Square Garden. There's 24, actually it's 23 point, I'll call it 23.5 million shares. The stock closed today probably around 215. It was 220 yesterday. They're having a meeting tomorrow night with analysts at the uh, garden. I, uh, unfortunately, I don't know what they're going to talk about. I'm going to be here, not there. Uh, they're gonna, I think they're going to talk about building a new facility in London and one in Las Vegas. I know they are, but I don't know what they're going to say. So they got a billion one in cash. So I multiply that out. I'm paying $5 billion. So the PE guys in the room, you're paying $5 billion. You got a, a billion dollars in cash. You're paying $3.9 billion for the company. I got the sports teams. Now, KP got hurt last night, so, you know, the Knicks and the Rangers, somebody's going to buy them. Somebody just bought the, Petita bought the, the Houston Rockets, $2.3 billion. And uh, Mark Cuban still owns the, and somebody else bought the, the guy from Balmer, was it, that bought the, uh, the LA Clippers, right? Yeah. So, uh, we think the value of the company is 280 plus what you can get. And then, in addition to that, uh, these are some of the elements. And we think this is a low number, 220, but I can't tell the analysts what to do anymore. <clears throat> they own some other things. This is uh, Irving Azoff. And so we look at the venues, okay? And this is what they own, but they're building one on uh, Sheldon Adelson's uh, land uh, by the convention center, and they just took some land in an, uh, that they bought in London, and they're going to announce something. But in addition to that, they have air rights. And we think the Hudson Yards in New York is a hot area, much like Nashville, much like Reno. Uh, and uh, that's extraordinarily valuable. The infrastructure, I'll do this quickly. Here's the, uh, what the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, where's the report card? D plus, up from D minus. 
we are really in bad shape. I mean, if you ever want to see it, go to LaGuardia Airport or drive up on I-95 to our office. Any event, this is the amount of money that you got to spend. Uh, airports, rail, schools, uh, and uh, what we did was we said, okay, Uber, it's a rental society, it's a sharing society. Equipment rentals, fairly simple, aerial work platforms, earth moving, material handling, and so on. The industry already has been outsourced. The number has not come in fully for 2017 yet. We think it's $51 billion just in North America. This is the growth rate. And that's before you get an infrastructure bill. They, uh, you talk to a contractor, it, you manage fleet risk, you have flexibility, you don't need licenses and so on. And the rental penetration is now up to 50%. It's a fragmented business. It's growing four to 5%. You're gonna get a huge tailwind. And basically, these are the companies we focus on. Herc, which is Hertz, H-R-I is the symbol. There's 28.3 million shares. It came, they spun it off from Hertz at around $28. Nobody wanted to own it because once you get a spin-off, they don't go into the indexes. And uh, so we own that. We go to London. Sunbelt is owned by Ashtead. We see them in our London office and United Rentals in Stanford. And the reason we bought it is a fragmented business. And uh, we bought it because, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so United Rentals, $186, $25 billion, Ashtead and Hertz. But the margins, because they were poorly managed with 34% EBITDA margins, the other guys were 47, 48, and uh, this guy, Larry uh, is Silver, who's running this, is a breath of fresh air, management turnaround, they're right here, one hour drive, an hour and 20 minutes, you'll see them. Sugar. Everyone except those in this room is getting older in the United States, and you want to live longer, and the problem is healthcare is a percentage of GDP. You saw that the uh, Bezos, Jimmy Dimon, and uh, Jamie Dimon and Buffett coming together and saying we're going to do something in healthcare. We have a problem. Uh, we're going to solve it. And part of the problem is uh, oh, these uh, minor things. Now, a male in 1960 weighed 163 pounds. Today is 195. Not bad. Gino, you wish. <laughs> He's bigger, faster, but it is what it is. Uh, the women shouldn't say anything uh, either because, as you see, they've gained weight. The problem is not that. It's uh, you have all sorts of health risks, okay? This is what Americans think is exercise, okay? And this is a guy going in a fitness center. <laughs> Yeah, walking up the escalator, yeah. But the problem is uh, there is an element uh, that you can trace the sugar. So we came up with this. This was, by the way, all those slides were courtesy of uh, Toby Cosgrove at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. We borrowed everything he did because he had it down. Uh, and we came up with sparkling water. I was in the, a supermarket in uh, Jackson Hole, uh, or whatever it's called. They wheel in a truckload on pallets of LaCroix. Three cases for $13.47. People were taking them out uh, three or four uh, uh, baskets at a time. So we said, let's go visit the company here in Boca. Meanwhile, he'd been sending us the annual reports. So this is the product. This is sparkling water. The growth rate in sparkling water has been phenomenal and it's continuing to grow. Now this is a slide that was taken out of page 21 out of the Dr. Pepper uh, Keurig, and they talk about all of the elements that go into uh, uh, consumption, non-alcohol, uh, not beer, not, war, uh, not booze, uh, and this is the one that I'm most intrigued about, is that sparkling water is 19, of which still water, but carbonated sparkling water, it's a small business growing at a substantial rate and they have a premium product at a low price. I like that, and they were the early movers. So this is the growth rate, and this is the company, National Beverage, and uh, uh, you know, the question is what price do you pay for the stock? It's doubled in the last 12 months. I used it in Barron's last year, and so the stock is now 46 million shares, 4.7 billion, and I, uh, this is the uh, company. I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but I'm gonna give it to you. Look how cute. 
pet parents. This is a business that is terrific. Third party pay, no, you private pay. We pay for our parents, ourselves. There's 223 million dogs, more than you ever want to know. Uh, global pet market's 121 billion. Now this is Steve Curry on his social media, eight million likes, Apple gets, these guys get 10. Oprah gets 112 million. By the way, Weight Watchers hit a new high yesterday. Uh, and then this guy gets a, a look at this, poor boo. The number of, uh, now fun facts from the APPA, American Pet Association, half of the dog owners give their pets a Christmas or a Hanukkah gift. Uh, or, both. Or, or both, yes, exactly. Uh, look at that, they give uh, gluten-free, grain-free food, uh, better than the dinner. And this is the pet statistics. Come on, how could you not want to be a pet parent? How many own a pet? Come on, raise your hands. All right, no comments about how you're doing it. The pet population in the United States, and we do a lot, all this stuff. We gather the uh, data, array the data, horses, and uh, we put it together. There's 500,000 vets in the United States, and we owned uh, veterinary centers of America when Mars, the candy company, bought in. So we were able to do that. And then this is how much you pay for pet insurance, dogs. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is uh, companies that are in the business, and generic, generic, injections are very interesting. So if somebody comes up to you with a PE firm or does it through crowdsourcing, and I'm just fast forwarding on this. This is how much the stocks did last year. These are some of the companies. I'm actually buying Patterson for clients. It's uh, unfortunately it's not as well managed as Shine. The stock is 33, 98 million shares located outside of uh, Minneapolis. Um, and so uh, these are some of the deals that were done. And uh, these are the companies, and we take uh, the data. These are some of the names, Oedis and Fibro and so on. And uh, you know, if some of you like, uh, uh, and then we do ESG, and I won't spend any time on it because I know you have some questions and dessert's been served. So let me stop, oh, I followed the movie industry. Go back 50, 50 years, 1965. A hot movie, X-rated. I'm gonna show you some clips. The graduate. What was the graduate telling somebody to do at that time? <laughs> We're all so proud of you. Proud, 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 proud. <laughs> what are you going to do now? I was going to go upstairs for a minute. Oh, I meant with your future. Your life. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanne. I'm curious. Thank you. Oh, he is just a friend. I look at him and I can't believe it. I, I simply can't I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly, how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Okay, that was really a, a dynamic in the 60s about where would, should you put money? And uh, let's tell you where today. Are you thinking about doing digital social media? Are you thinking about doing a uh, startup firm? Here's what you would do today. I just want to say one thing to you. Just one certification. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. CFA. Exactly, how do you mean? There's a great future for CFAs. Think about it. Any event, I know this, uh, we have a mixed group here, so I didn't know, uh, you know, there were some wannabe CFAs and there are some that have had certificates for 2,700 on. So I'm open to any questions you have. I brought a, uh, 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 these things for clients that worry about the market going up and down. So I figured uh, you would have, I didn't overpay for this, so it's not working well. It ain't a Duncan. Uh, questions? I know it's late. I know you passed uh, the time that I was allotted. I don't have a watch, please. Yes, hi, thank you, Mr. Gabelli. Um, how do you think the robo um, investing new wave of 
ETF, people trying to do their own investing in ETFs, it's going to change the research industry as a whole. I, 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 look, I think the answer is it, there will be accommodations, much like uh, when I used to take an elevator, there was an elevator operator. I used to be a pin boy at adult bowling alley, and then I went to automatic. The world is changing. So there is no question that you have someone that instead of buying a $10 for a, uh, a beer or something like that, or, or a cappuccino with latte or something from Starbucks, they want to put it in their account and open an account at Betterment. There's no, you have to be in the position of understanding that dynamic and uh, looking at technology as part of what you're doing. On the other side of the coin, what happens on Monday, <laughs> you know, uh, to handle the dynamics of the individual? You have to know the client. You have to understand not what is the mechanics of the client, but what happens when the market keeps going up and up and they come into you and say, well, I don't care about the fact that I'm 70 years old. I want you to buy me Bitcoin. And how do you talk to them? Can you do that with artificial intelligence? AI is going to work, but they also need you. So there's nothing, uh, you got to have a combination of both. Yeah. I, that's not answering your question, but that's the best I'm going to do. Yeah. One way to look at some of the presentation you had might be to think about it that you have a thematic approach to what's going to be happening in the future. What are the themes like the movie clips and plastics? But, uh, so how do you differentiate between what is a theme versus what is a, what is a fad that you yeah, I know. Uh, you know the taser gun, the uh, uh, Krispy Kreme versus uh, McDonald's. Uh, basically, when you have analysts that cover the same industry for an extended period of time, you try to differentiate. So you, the worst possibility is to have an individual that's a generalist, and today you tell them go look at Mattel. Tomorrow you tell them to go look at Henry Schein. It is very hard to have a compounded and accumulated knowledge. So what we try to do every day as analysts is have analysts cover an industry, and then we edge out. So we have today a team that works on the digital world. We have somebody uh, that will do uh, three-dimensional printing, and the, now that the stocks have collapsed, we're looking at them, and what, what companies do we want to own? Uh, it is very, where is the moat? How does the company have what the value teams call a, uh, a barrier to entry? How is their pricing power? You take a look at something, uh, Okay, I mentioned it. Rollins, Inc. I started following Rollins in Atlanta 50 years ago. O. Wayne Rollins just did a leveraged buyout of a company called Arkin. And they have used technology now to set up appointments, and they have these little things that come around all the time. And they want to kill them, like termites and bugs. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you get lucky, not lucky, you get the bed bugs. And they come, you come up with new products and innovations, and they have pricing power, and it's still a low-cost item. And we make a lot of mistakes, okay? So uh, that's what we do. And I, uh, my only job is to take these 40 analysts and try to make them uh, sure that they're digging into the details. Chris. So with your international offices now, I noticed most of your suggestions might work for U.S. Uh, equity. Are you looking at equities? Are you starting to do any international? Okay, the question is, where are we globally? Well, uh, it was November of 1989. We would, I went to Japan and China in the early 80s as the auto analyst, I was the, and so on, blah, blah, blah. And we always covered globally. But we never invested for clients globally. But after the Berlin Wall came down, we said that Karl Marx is pushed aside and Adam Smith and Ricardo are still the best ways to allocate capital on a global basis. So we start, we don't cover Germany, we don't cover Japan, we don't cover China, we don't cover Africa, we don't cover Latin America, we cover industry. So if you drink something, no matter where in the world, if it's a public company, we follow it. So you take the booze business. It's only about a $450 billion business. There's, so we would follow in uh, uh, Lexington, uh, Brown Foreman. We go to Italy and Campari, which owns Grand Marnier and Wild Turkey. We go to Paris to follow Pernod and Irish whiskey called uh, Jameson. Then we would go to London and follow Diageo. Then we go to Japan and then we follow a company in China called Motai. So we follow whatever you drink anywhere in the world. And you know, the good news is there's three billion new uh, people and the 
individuals in China and India, uh, there are certain dynamics that as income rises in those countries, every 1% change in uh, real disposable income, you have an income elasticity that allows them to buy premium products. And so this works well for us on a global basis. But we're not going to go in and say we're experts on Chile or we're going to uh, Argentina because Maurizio Macri is really changing the economy and the country down there. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, but we'll follow agriculture. So that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Yeah. With the uh, repatriation of assets overseas coming back to the United States with tax reform, uh, how is that going to drive the mergers? And who do you think the short lists are with regard to acquirees and acquirers? Well, uh, clearly, I think you're going to see Pfizer and the uh, big pharma companies starting to buy each other. You showed uh, three or four already this year. I think you're going to see another round of consolidation in the entertainment business. I think you're going to see it in the wireless world. There's a lot of industries that are ready. And once you change significant financial companies, SIFI, you're going to see banks in Georgia, what's north of Georgia, South Carolina, um, uh, North Carolina, oh, and Florida, they're going to buy them. So you got a FCB, stock's $52. They're probably the best public bank in Florida. It's going to be taken over once those rules change. So you look at consolidation in industries. What multiple do they pay of tangible book? Who's got loan origination capability? So you put the list together. So that's a good question. On the other side of the coin, uh, I as an individual running a company, and I do run a public company among other things. I run a bunch of them actually. Uh, when I was hiring an analyst, don't take this the wrong way, uh, it would only cost me 65 cents because I would have got a 35% tax deduction from federal. Now it's costing me 79 cents because I only get a 21% deduction. We don't think that way, no. <laughs> <laughs> if you were nervous about the market, um, would you raise cash? Or what is the no, we, uh, no. We, we are basically, we tell our clients we're fully invested all the time. We're not market timers. We don't know anything about the market. Uh, but basically, when we think that uh, uh, we can't find anything that's expensive. We will use what was just asked. We will buy uh, a, a company that's being taken over. If we're going to earn seven, eight percent, and uh, you know, if I step back, if I take a look at the gross world product, U.S. Let's say U.S. only. I think GDP grows three percent cyclically, maybe higher. But on secular basis, you've got 2.5% plus inflation. Let's call inflation 253 You've got a 5%. If I own every company in the S&P, uh, assume all domestic companies, I think gross margins are going to get squeezed because labor is going up. But I think they're going to cover SG&A. And I think tax rates are down. I think we buy an ETF, we're going to earn 7 or 8 or 9%. OK, combination. And so that's over the next 10 years. So you, the individuals in this room know who their clients are. Where and how do you match their client needs with their portfolios, and where are they in terms of how to allocate capital? That's, we can't do that. We do it ourselves. We are not wealth managers. We're equity managers, and we want to buy nano caps, micro caps, small cap, all the way up. I had a CEO yesterday of a company called XYZ. That's not the symbol. <laughs> uh, the stock is selling at $3.25. He was an analyst, much like Bezos, much like Jim Murren, who's at running MGM. And he is doing a gambling company. He was the CFO for Steve Wynn after he left Drexel. He started this company. And the stock's $3.30. And he's going to build up a pretty interesting company over the next five years. We got a triple, a three-bagger without blinking. OK, we got a company called RL Gel Entertainment, Bob Johnson's company, that is uh, uh, has content and distribution. The stock is selling at $3.25 with 15 million shares. And then we go up and look at some larger companies. We're not particularly anxious to own Apple. Uh, it's uh, very few people cover, cover it. <laughs> and uh, how do you add value as an analyst? Do, do, looking for what every, everyone else looks at? Or where do they not look? And the number of analysts on the sell side are shrinking, and they've got to cover the big companies. And that's a comparative advantage over time. Yeah, please. Another question? You can't ask one. <laughs> yeah, please. In the uh, media sector, building TV content, you've always followed that closely. Uh, a lot of M&A activities. Any, any thoughts, specifics on what you'd like in that area? <clears throat> um, 
Yeah, some of the redstone is 94. He was supposed to die two years ago, according to his girlfriend's in the written testimony. Uh, but essentially, Sherry is running the company. She owns the vote on both, and she's the surrogate owner, and she's trying to figure out a way to put CBS and Viacom together, okay? Uh, Viacom has the great non-US distribution. They have uh, an interesting operations in, the U in India, which is growing nicely. I think something will happen there. I think that uh, you know, Sky is going to be bought by uh, Disney. Uh, if Murdoch doesn't do it in advance, the stock is 10 pounds. 25 today. Uh, he's got 10.75 on the table. I think you've got to get a kiss, and I think Elliot will try to squeeze him for a little more. But in bigger companies, will Apple step up and decide to buy Disney? You know, you've got a company with 800 billion market cap, and Disney's only got about a 1.6 billion shares times 105 today. So it's only got 170 billion. Verizon is a tiny company. They only got 200 billion market cap. Uh, telephone is a small company of 200 billion compared to uh, Amazon, Alphabet, Google, and those companies. And Facebook uh, is about 400 billion. And then you got this guy, Jack Ma, and the other Ma, a 10 cent a growing. So there's a lot going on. My selection for you is the following I think you're going to see uh, the Federal Communication IG Pi is going to basically allow more than companies to buy more TV stations. So I think Marriott, it after they bought. The uh, magazines from Time Inc., which just closed last week, they'll put the magazines at a TV station, spin them off, somebody else will merge with them. So you'll have another round of consolidation in the broadcasting. In terms of filmed content, you know, Malone owns a piece of Live Nation. Uh, that is a very interesting business. Uh, this is live concerts, but they also own Ticketmaster, which bothers me a little bit. But the stock's going from 28 to 46, so I'm kind of watching what they're doing. Um, there's a lot going on in that area. What Rupert is doing is basically doing the following. He's gonna, there's gonna be 550 million shares issued of Disney on top of to buy Fox, the portion that they're buying. So there's gonna be 2.15 billion shares outstanding. He's gonna own 110 million shares. He's gonna be the largest owner except for Larry Fink and the guys at Vanguard and State Street. So the ETFs, you back them out, He's going to be the largest shareholder. Eisner's going to uh, Iger's going to retire in two years. And Rupert is basically going to figure out a way to get more influence at Disney. So is he selling to Disney or is he buying Disney? You know, everybody's got their points of view. It's kind of fun to watch all of this. Anyway, I have no points of view on the business. Question? Yeah. Again, one more here. I'll come back. Do you have a sell this one or do you not sell it? Oh, we are so bad. We basically try to buy companies that the sell discipline is baked in. We thought that Herc would be taken over uh, by Ashted in London. So we go see Ashted and we point out that, you know, Carl Icahn owns, we own 15% for our clients of the company. He owns 15%. Navistar, we figured it out right. We figured uh, Volkswagen would buy it or they would merge with Iveco and uh, they would buy it. Well, Volkswagen, uh, so uh, now where we're wrong, <laughs> we didn't buy Netflix, okay? I bid 79.80, the stock got down to 80.50. It is what it is, okay? So I make a lot of mistakes. Those are not in our numbers, okay? We've compounded at 16.3% for 40 years, and we've been down uh, five years, and we're gonna be down again, okay? And, uh, but um, Earl Scheib, I knew more about the car repainting business. I actually had a car that I took and had it repainted, 1995. They did the windshields, they did the tires, they did everything. And uh, Earl Scheib and I would meet every time I'd go to LA. I held that stock for 35 years, they wouldn't listen, uh, and we got the same price I paid. So, you know, what's my mistakes? We make so many mistakes, it's incredible. But on balance, we are a lot like Ted Williams. He, I hate to do this to the Boston guys. He made out three out of five times. We're gonna make out a lot. And the ones that you don't see is like Ferrari. We bought a little bit of stock at 38 to 40, and we still own it, but, uh, and Facebook we bought after it dropped, uh, we went public at 40 and dropped to 18, I think, or 22. And we, we like that, busted deals. We didn't buy Blue Apron or something like that. We did buy a little bit of Groupon. We make so many mistakes, it's incredible. And by the way, if anybody has an idea and you own a stock, tell us. 
that you and why you like it. <laughs> but don't tell us that uh, Nick Caparella died. That would we don't want to. We hope he lives for another 20 years. Yeah. You said much great work on you know, analyzing and looking at uh, research and so on. Do you look at your uh, batting average and your win loss ratios? As Every day. Uh, we are not competitive, but. Uh, <laughs> but what, what, what do you say? What, do you, what I mean? How bad? How, how many? Maybe, like you say, you make a lot of mistakes, but if you have a, you know, less than fifty percent, but the win loss ratio is really great. Oh, you mean how many stocks don't work? That's right. Versus like, and then the win, the win, the win. No, what we do is the following. We're put, uh, you know, we're equity managed. So I could say that our separately managed accounts for the last forty years, which is, that's uh, corporate accounts. Uh, we, I gave you the number, but uh, somebody knows it better than I do. 16.2% Scott gross and the 15.4 net, and we've had five down years. And we have a lot of stocks that don't do anything. Uh, but on the other side of the coin, you get something like Dr. Pepper, which we've owned twice. Dr. Pepper, we never thought Mr. Young would uh, basically sell out to uh, Keurig the way he did, okay? And uh, uh, that's an interesting deal. Uh, uh, we watch the 3G guys and try to figure out whether they're going to buy Mondelez or whether they're going to do Unilever. And, uh, you know, right now we think uh, uh, in the pharmaceutical area. So uh, someone here may have those numbers. I don't look at it that way. I am not... I can't tell you my tracking error, my standard deviations, my, uh, give me some more things that I don't know anything about. What? My driver's license? Yeah, that's it. Oh, you know all of these things. He's the one that keeps me honest, by the way. Um, that's 25 years ago. Do you think he remembers that? How long ago? 25 years ago, Gino got the Heisman. So you remember that number. And he reminds me all the time when we talk. Um, Thank you, Gino, for being here. Um, and oh my God, are you going to ask for a signature or a photograph? Um, thank you very much. I, I'm staying around, Chris. Thank you. I do want to thank Mr. Gabelli again. That was not only fabulously educational, it was also incredibly entertaining. <laughs> I think he'll be sitting at the table with his, his team and his wife. If you have a couple more questions, I'm sure he'll be had to, happy to oblige you.